So today we're going to talk about the chemistry of life. Both organic and inorganic are made up of four main elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and as you can see, oxygen, we're 65%, atmosphere is 21%, earth is 46%. With carbon, we definitely are more of an organic molecule or form of life since we're 18% carbon and 10% hydrogen. Keep in mind, an organic molecule is defined as something that has carbon-carbon, carbon-hydrogen bonding. And then those things that aren't organic, that are inorganic, have trace carbon and trace and minuscule amounts of hydrogen. Nitrogen, we're 3%. And with the atmosphere, atmosphere is actually 78%. So even though oxygen is very important to life, the atmosphere and the air we believe is actually 78%. And some things that are toxic to living organisms, some living organisms like arsenic, other organisms have adapted. Some flowers can take up lead, zinc, and other heavy metals. And they were actually planted after Hurricane Katrina to help detoxify the soil and then were pulled up by their roots and put with the other contaminated waste. So bacteria, plants, Lots of other organisms are able to help to decontaminate our environment. So the basic unit of life is an atom. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons reside in the nucleus of an atom. Protons have a plus one charge and a weight of one atomic mass unit. Whereas neutrons have no charge, but also have a mass of one atomic mass unit. The electrons reside in these shells outside of the nucleus. Electrons have minus one charge but they contribute very little to the mass of an atom. They are one two thousandths of an atomic mass unit. And again, they exist out in the orbitals surrounding the nucleus and the nucleus houses the neutrons and the protons. Electrons are also what give you your reactivity of an atom, how reactive it's gonna be, because it is the sharing or the gain and loss of electrons that out allow bonds to form, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And so how do you determine how many protons, neutrons, electrons are in an atom? So looking here, when you see it in this annotation, the top number is the mass number. And our mass number is our number of protons plus our number of neutrons. The smaller number, the bottom number, is our atomic number. And that is the number of protons. And so if you want to figure out how many neutrons you have, take the mass number minus the atomic number. Because we just told you mass number is protons plus neutrons. And atomic number is protons. So if you take protons and neutrons and subtract the protons, it'll give you the number of neutrons. And here's a video that you can go watch if you would like to see more detail on atomic number, mass number, ions, and isotopes. Here is the representation of a periodic table. And when you look here, this number is your atomic number. This is your atomic mass. Your atomic number never changes. Proton number never changes. But this mass is actually a average of all the isotopes that exist of each of these elements. And you can go to this interactive periodic table.
if you want to look at that more. And so you get your properties, you can look at the electron shells, and you can look at isotopes. And you can see oxygen has a lot of different isotopes. And so again, notice always eight on the protons, but it is only the mass number that changes. And so isotopes of oxygen are very numerous. But again, there is an interactive link with the slides if you want to go look at that some more. Or when you do some of your homework, you'll see that sometimes your homework is going to have calculating number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so we mentioned isotopes. And as I said, your proton number never changes. Anytime that you see an atomic number of six, you know that it's going to be carbon. No matter what, atomic number of six means carbon. But this atomic mass can change. Atomic mass of this isotope, so when your neutrons change, you're getting different isotopes. So this isotope would have a molecular weight or an atomic mass, I don't know why I said that, atomic mass of 12, whereas this isotope would have an atomic mass of 13, and this would have an atomic mass of 14, because remember, atomic mass is protons times neutrons. So atomic number never changes, always the same number of protons, but atomic mass can change because neutrons change. And you can always think of it as that six tells you it's carbon, just like you know an apple is an apple. But you have different varieties of apples. So you have a Granny Smith or a Red Delicious or a Fuji. Same thing with carbon. Six protons, you know you always have carbon, but you can have different varieties or different isotopes of that particular atom. And you can see more on that if you want to view this video. And again, interactive link will take you to the video that you can view online. This, uh... So as I mentioned earlier, it is the electrons in this outer shell that actually gives an atom its chemical behavior. So how it's going to interact and bond with other atoms. And so it'll form chemical bonds depending on how many electrons it has in this outer shell. Atoms always want a full valence shell. And so the first orbit always has two electrons to be full, second has eight, and the third for our purposes, not if you take a chemistry class, will be that the rest reside there. And they always want to try to achieve a full outer shell. And so here you can see some varying atoms with their electrons. And so hydrogen only has one, so it will won't another one or it'll give this one away so that it has a full outer shell. These groups over here all are full. So helium has two, it's full and happy. Neon has eight in its outer shell, it's happy. Argon has eight in its outer shell, it is happy. Fluorine and chloride both have seven, so they really want one more to make that one full. Carbon is one of our more reactive atoms and this because it has four in this outer shell so it can form four different bonds and then over here all these guys with just one they tend to donate or give away their electron and so first type of bond we're going to talk about are covalent bonds covalent bonds share so covalent share 
And if they are sharing one electron, because remember hydrogen has one electron, and if it shares with another hydrogen, they each have two, and that makes that they have a full outer shell. This would be delineated by a single line. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. So when two oxygen molecules come together, they each share two electrons with the other oxygen, delineating a double bond. But by each sharing two, six plus two gives you eight. They each have eight now in their outer shell and they are happy. With oxygen, remember oxygen has six, hydrogen has one. So oxygen needs two. So if two hydrogens come and share their one electron with oxygen and oxygen shares one electron with each of them, then everybody's happy. Oxygen has eight, six plus two. And each hydrogen has one more to fill up to the two in that inner shell. And as I mentioned earlier, carbon has those four electrons in the outer shell. So he is able to form four bonds. Each hydrogen has one. So four hydrogens donate one each. So that's four plus four gives you eight. He lets each hydrogen share one of his electrons, and so each of those get two. So everybody is full and happy. And again, when you share one electron, it's a single bond. When you share two, it's two. And when you see nitrogen and nitrogen, they actually share three, and so that would be a triple bond. And so with covalent bonds, you get polar versus nonpolar. And what that means is that the electronegativity, so how many protons are in that oxygen atom and how many shells it has around it, will determine how strong of a pull it has on its electrons. And so one of these guys has a higher electronegativity and oxygen has eight protons in its shell, its nucleus. So eight positives are going to pull a little stronger on those electrons than the one proton, the one positive in the hydrogen. And so since those eight positives in the oxygen pull those electrons slightly closer to oxygen, you generate this negative pole. And with the hydrogen, because the electrons are pulled closer to the oxygen, you generate a slightly positive pole. And so when you generate poles, you have a polar molecule and a polar molecule is unequal sharing. The atoms do not share the electrons equally. But then something like methane gas or carbon dioxide, they are going to be nonpolar. And so they are going to share their electrons equally. And lipids, lipids tend to be a nonpolar molecule and they share their electrons equally. With ionic bonds, you're going to form ions. So as I pointed out earlier, chloride has seven in its outer shell. Sodium only has one. Sodium wants to get rid of this one and it'll drop back to its full shell right below that. And then chloride wants to gain one so that it will get a full outer shell. And so sodium willingly gives its extra electron to chloride. When it does that, it becomes a cation because now it is positively charged. The chloride gains an electron and so it becomes more negative. It is an anion. You also receive these called when a molecule, when an atom gives away an electron, it becomes oxidized. When it gains an electron, it is reduced because its charge is reduced. And a lot of times these types of reactions are called oxidation reduction reactions or reduction oxidation reactions, redox reactions. But when a molecule completely gives away or completely accepts, gets a positive one or a negative one, they are now referred to as ions. So when they gain a charge, they are ions of total charge. And ions have an attractive force between each other. The positive and negative attract, and that is called an ionic bond. 
And then our last type of bonding is hydrogen bonding. And as I've showed you earlier, you have polar covalent bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogens. So you have a polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Polar means they are unequally shared. Polar generates these poles on the molecule, so it gets a slightly negative and a slightly positive pole. Because it gets a slightly negative and a slightly positive pole, it can be attracted to other polar molecules that also have developed these slightly negative, slightly positive poles. So polar molecules unequally share their electrons and they develop a positive, a slightly positive or a slightly negative pole. And then the negative, slightly negative pole of one molecule is then attracted to the slightly positive molecule of another. And you can see this in all these water molecules. So the covalent bonds are the strongest, hydrogen bonds are the weakest, and then ionic are in the middle, but when you get large numbers of these hydrogen bonds, they can exert a very strong force. And when you have a polar molecule, polar molecule is hydrophilic. It is a water loving, has affinity for water, is attracted to water, will dissolve in water. When you have a nonpolar molecule, it is hydrophobic. It is one that does not have an affinity for water. It is a lipid typically, and there are other hydrophobic surfaces, but it will not dissolve in water. Oil and water never mix. And so all molecules are hydrophobic because they are relatively nonpolar, which means they equally share their electrons. So this will conclude our talk on atomic structure and bonds.